This is war. War and its masses. War and its men. War and its machines. Together they form the big picture. Welcome to the big picture. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman. The big picture is a report to you from your army. An army committed by you, the people of the United States, to stop communist aggression wherever it may strike. The big picture traces the course of events in the Korean campaign through first-hand reports of our combat veterans and through film taken by combat cameramen of the armed forces and produced by the Army Signal Corps. These are the men who daily record on film the big picture as it happens, where it happens. Today, the big picture will show the beginning of the Korean truce talks. You will see those early meetings of our negotiators at Kaesong, and later, You'll meet two men who played an important part in the big picture, Sergeant Jim Heidenreich, who was a combat engineer and a rifleman with the 1st Cavalry Division, and Lieutenant Robert Fallon, who was a platoon leader with the Army's 7th Division. And now for part of the big picture, let's go back to June 1951. From 20 June to 20 July, attention in Korea is focused on Kaesong, site of ceasefire peace negotiations. The first meeting is scheduled for 10 July. The UN negotiators establish a base camp near Munsan, commuting to each of the conferences at Kaesong. On 21 July, the communists request a recess in the peace negotiations. It has become apparent by this time that the Reds are staging a buildup of force above the neutralized Kaesong area. However, during this period, only minor changes occur in the Korean battle line as action is confined to patrols and minor clashes. This limited fighting continues as further truce developments are in the offing. From the beginning, the Kaesong story is the story of stalemate. It began late in June when Russia's Malik suggested peace talks. And, of course, the North Koreans and Chinese Red volunteers were ready to listen. Kaesong has been agreed upon as a neutral zone of conference. The first representatives, with no rank to exceed that of Colonel, leave Mun Son, the site of the UN peace camp, on 8 July. They have been instructed to make no commitments for the UN. They are limited to establishing an agenda for future talks and to assuring safe conduct to UN delegates during the armistice meetings. They are empowered to come to agreement on what is to be discussed, to make it clear to the communists that the armistice talks must take up military matters only. With this program and these limitations clearly understood, the helicopter bearing the general's representatives takes off from Mun San. At Kaesong, the letter W, which marks the landing strip, is taken to mean welcome. Later, UN reporters insist it stands for the Korean word for stalling. Keep in mind that the communists rejected General Ridgway's suggestion that the talks be held aboard a Dutch hospital ship. They requested Kaesong within their own lines as a neutral meeting place. Nevertheless, the UN negotiators follow their host to the courtyard with open minds. The uniformed Chinese woman turns out to be not a high official, as was first supposed, but a competent interpreter. She was the only uniformed woman they saw. The town of Kaesong gives the impression of peace and tranquility. Early pictures of the conference on agreement reveal nothing of the tension that prevails, of the long arguments over simple matters of procedure. Nor do the UN representatives return to Munsan 
with much that is significant for the waiting reporters. Their attitude, their poker faces, seem to say only, wait and see. But it was later learned that during that first conference, and the one of 11 July, the communists took pictures of UN representatives being stopped at roadblocks by armed reds. Those pictures, widely distributed throughout Asia, suggested that vanquished UN forces were seeking peace from their victorious enemy. Totally unaware of this, Admiral Joy leaves Munson for his first meeting with the North Koreans and representatives of the Chinese communists, who have given up the pretext of being volunteers and do most of the talking. Admiral Joy is quite willing to have it so, knowing full well that the North Koreans are no longer in a position to make any decisions of their own. The communist negotiators arrive with an attitude of arrogant overconfidence. Even while the first armistice talks begin, armed reds are in evidence within the very shadow of the conference room. True, no guns are drawn, nobody gets hurt. But the propaganda value of these pictures, also taken by the reds and distributed throughout Asia, do irreparable harm to the stature of UN forces. The same forces which had, in truth, inflicted losses on the reds to a ratio of 100 to 1. However, the first conference ends without incident, without too much friction, but certainly without decision. Admiral Joy could only say the talks would continue so long as there was the slightest hope for agreement. But he does not fail to observe the armed communists playing soldier, close by the medieval-like castle that is to serve as his billet. an imposing pile of stone inside of which somebody had forgot to put a latrine. But petty annoyances do not prevent the Admiral and his staff from relaxing after this first historic meeting. He is obviously aware that the Orientals will bargain with characteristic deliberation, whether they truly want peace or only time to regroup their scattered forces. Even at this first meeting with Admiral Joy, the Reds ignore General Ridgway's request that the talks be confined to military matters. But when Admiral Joy and his staff return to Munson, the door to peace is not slammed shut. It is still ajar. Neither the delegates nor General Ridgway's staff have much to say to the anxiously waiting UN correspondents. But the reporters do learn that the Reds had full press representation at the meeting. The UN correspondents are quickly promised that they will be allowed to attend all future meetings. In a few minutes, we'll return to our film and the story of the truce negotiations at Kaesong. But first, we'd like you to meet Sergeant Jim Heidenreich, who is a combat engineer and a rifleman with the 1st Cavalry Division in Korea. Well, Jim, you saw this town of Kaesong, didn't you? Yes, sir. Well, what was it like? Well, Kaesong, before the war especially, was a beautiful town. It's known in, as one of the most beautiful in that part of the East. It's a western city in, in all aspects. It had modern conveniences, had streetcars, and so forth, electricity. Well, that's something a lot of us didn't realize, Jim. Well, now let's talk about you. What was your job with the first calf? I had a uh, anti-tank and mine platoon. Uh, anti-tank and mine platoon is something new in the Army. Uh, it uh, is a more or less engineer troubleshooting team attached on an infantry level, infantry regiment level. Our job was to go out with the infantry, remove mines, lay mines, uh, in some cases pick up booby traps and actually lay them. Well, that's not the safest job in the world, Jim. No, it wasn't. Well, now there were other combat engineers with the 1st Cavalry Division. There were a lot of jobs to be done, and perhaps one of the most important, Jim, was bridge building, isn't that right? That's true. In engineering, bridge building is always important. Uh, I remember just north of uh, Chunshan, the 8th Engineers, attached to the 1st Cavalry, had been ordered to build a bridge across the Pukhan River. 
it was necessary to build a bridge to get the troops across at Bakan uh, to a staging area for the attack to the north, north to the Iron Triangle area. The engineers worked for four days under adverse weather conditions. Well, four days and four nights, because they had to work at night under floodlights. Under floodlights? Under floodlights. And you can really appreciate that when you realize that they were located two to three hundred yards ahead of our front lines and had the security a company from the 16th Recon to support them and uh, protect them. And they were under constant harassing mortar fire and long-range machine gun and rifle fire for the entire time. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this bridge meant we could get our tanks and our infantry across and keep on going, huh? That's correct. Uh, of course, it's history now. They actually crossed the river, made the attack north, and were successful. And they could not have been done without the engineers. Well, when our infantry tank teams moved out, Jim, certainly the engineers were with them. That's true, and it's not as well known, but actually the uh, engineers can be said to spearhead such advances. On your tank infantry patrol and any of your tank infantry assaults, the first tank is an engineer tank. It's supposed to have only engineers on it. It'll have one or three engineers on it with mine detecting equipment. If they get into an area where it is known that mines exist, they'll dismount, go forward and clear a lane ahead of the tanks and the infantry. Or if they hit a mine, of course, they'll dismount and clear a line for the assault. So they can be said to spearhead and as much as the attack can only go as fast as they go if it's in a mined area. Well, Jim, you've given us a good idea of the work of the combat engineers with our riflemen in Korea. But now let's talk about you. What are you doing now? I'm a senior instructor in photogrammetry, or rather map making, at Fort Belvoir. Fort Belvoir, Virginia? Home That's of correct. the engineers, right? Home of the engineers. That's right. Well, thanks again, Jim, and a lot of luck to you. And now let's return to Korea in July and August of 1951 and resume our story of the truce negotiations at Kaesong. But even as the delegates returned to Kaesong, accompanied by the press of the some 16 nations with troops in Korea, it seems that the Reds are preparing a strange welcome indeed. They did not intend to give up the power and propaganda of a single Red voice, crying its slanted news to the outside world. Already in the hands of Chinese communists was ample evidence by word and picture of how the Reds had distorted the news from Kaesong. For while the conference thus far had not even discussed the agenda originally agreed on because of the haggling of the Reds, Peking radio and newspapers were avidly reporting each meeting as a failure of the UN negotiators to meet honorable terms of the victors. This impression had to be corrected. General Ridgway bids goodbye to the correspondents. The general makes sure that all of them have availed themselves of the opportunity to report the true situation at Quezon. But outside of Kaesong, they encounter a situation that shocks the free world. The reporters are met and stopped by armed Reds. This commissar of press relations is telling the correspondents of 16 United Nations that the world will hear of the armistice talks through the truthful communist press. Not in the history of modern ceasefire negotiations, has there been such a crude breach of international law and ethics? The communists are anxious to have the rest of the vehicles continue without the newsmen, but UN officers refuse to break up the convoy. Further discussions fail to resolve the problem. The red refusal to pass the complete convoy is relayed back to Monsan. The convoy is instructed to return if not passed by 0930. At the 0930 deadline, the vehicles turn around and head for Monsan.
they promptly make their report to General Ridgway of the high-handed treatment they had received at Quezon. The General's decision is immediate and decisive. Within a short period of time, the world was receiving General Ridgway's ultimatum from the lips of his aide, General Allen. This is Brigadier General Frank A. Allen, Jr., United States Army. Chief of Information, United Nations Command, Advance Camp in Korea. Broadcasting a message from General M.B. Ridgway, Commander-in-Chief, United Nations Command, to General Kim Il-Yung, since the first meeting at Kaesong, your delegation has placed restrictions upon the movement of our delegation. It has subjected our personnel to the close proximity of your armed guards. It has delayed and blocked passage of our couriers. It, is, it has withheld its cooperation in the establishment of two-way communications with our base, even though it agreed to do so immediately. It has refused admittance to the conference area of certain personnel in our convoy, which I desired, and for whose conduct I stated as I assumed full responsibility. The extension of the present recess and the delay in resum resuming the conference of our delegations is solely due to these unreasonable and unnecessary restrictions against which my representatives have repeatedly protested. The assurances which I require are simple and few. They include as primary prerequisites the establishment of an agreed conference area of suitable extent, completely free of armed personnel of either side. Each delegation must have complete reciprocity of treatment to include complete and equal freedom of movement to, from, and within the agreed conference area, and complete and equal freedom at all times in the selection of the personnel in its delegation party to include representatives of the press. I therefore now propose that a circular area with its center at approximately the center of Quezon and with a five mile radius be agreed upon as a neutral zone. The eastern limit of the neutral zone shall be the present point of contact of our forces at Pan Munjong. I propose that we both agree to refrain from hostile acts of any kind within this zone during the entire period of our conferences. I propose that we agree that the area of the conference site and the roads leading thereto, used by personnel of both delegation parties, be completely free of armed personnel. Should you continue to insist that restrictions are necessary for our personal safety, or for any other reason, I propose that the conference site be moved to a locality which will afford the few simple assurances I have specified herein. Signed, M.B. Ridgway, General, United States Army, Commander-in-Chief, United Nations Command. That is all. The communist bluff has been called. The general's terms are quickly accepted without argument. On 15 July, the armistice talks are resumed. The UN delegates return to Kaesong with a full complement of reporters, radio equipment, and cameras. From now on, no white flags will be carried to be misinterpreted by enemy press, and only the agreed-on minimum of red MPs are cited. Although the Reds attempt to belittle the controversy that stalled negotiations, the UN delegation is relieved of the tension created by the ominous presence of the Reds' submachine guns. The inscrutable communist delegates give no indication that they have been caught red-handed trying to pull a fast one. Admiral Joy is hopeful of progress now, since the Reds have made their first definite concession. But though the UN correspondents now have freedom of activity, they are hard put to keep busy during the days of 15 to 21 July. The conference produces little that is newsworthy. There is, however, one happy result. For the first day within 53 weeks of fighting, 24 hours pass in which not one U.S. soldier is killed. It seems evident now that at least the communist reporters and cameramen are ready and anxious to be friendly. 
another conference ends with the Reds insisting that the military demarcation line must be at the 38th parallel, and they insist on discussing political matters that must be left to the UN assembly. The communists have given the UN negotiators assurance of complete freedom of movement within a half mile radius of the conference building and in the neutral corridor from Munsan. Telephone communications are set up from Kaesong to the Munsan peace camp. To ensure reliable radio communications, North Mountain near Seoul is selected as the site for the construction of a relay station. This station is part of the radio network, connecting Munson with 8th Army headquarters in Seoul and General Ridgeway's offices in Tokyo. The altitude of the mountaintop reduces interference by surrounding hills and increases the effective range of the station. While the ceasefire talks are going on, UN commanders are keeping close contact with the enemy in the field and preventing him from gaining ground. However, it is apparent that the communists are staging a large-scale buildup of troops, particularly above Kaesong. There is formal acceptance at this time by General Nam Il of the principle that hostilities will continue until an armistice can be fully worked out. These armed Chinese being chased from the conference area are forerunners of more who will later march through Kaesong and cause still another ultimatum. During the week 15 to 21 July, the negotiators agree to list three points on the agenda for the ceasefire talks. One, the physical details of stopping the fighting. Two, the definition of the ceasefire line. Three, safeguards against resumption of the fighting. The Reds also want to list another topic, to wit, the withdrawal of foreign troops from Korea. Admiral Joy refuses to accept this as part of the agenda. This firmness by the UN negotiators causes General Nam Il to request a four-day recess, presumably for further instruction. The request is granted. The conference table is empty, except perhaps for the ever-present spirit of Jake Mully, past master of the stall and the double top. The world spotlight was on the Korean truce talks at this time, and too often it was forgotten that the infantryman was still in his hole, still in the line, doing that same job. That's the man we'd like to talk about right now. Lieutenant Robert Fallon, who led these riflemen in battle in Korea, knows these men. Bob? This has been the Infantry Soldiers War, and never in this country's history has any war required him to be so skillful. He's had to master the use of a dozen different weapons. He's had to learn the stealth of the Indian in night combats and patrols, and the hardiness of the Eskimo in staying alive in sub-zero weather. And again, never has any campaign ever required him to be so tough. These are the things that, that the American people have asked him to do. We've asked him to fight in a land thousands of miles from his home. We've asked him to risk his life daily. And the only reason that he's really aware of for this is that the American people have asked him to. Now, there's none of the compulsion of the Civil War when the men were defending their homelands and none of the national dedication of the big world wars when the entire world was inflamed. No, he's fighting today because we've asked him to fight, but that's good enough for him. We've asked him to endure temperatures 30 degrees colder than those known to the gallant men that followed George Washington into Valley Forge. We've asked him to undergo three trying and difficult withdrawals one of them in the bitter, merciless heat of summer, and the two others in the misery and cold of a Manchurian winter. And, 
and all of them against odds at times more staggering than those faced by the valiant defenders of Bataan. Three times we've asked him to turn and stand against these odds. The American infantryman dug his hole and manned his weapons and he held. And he held at a place where very often the tanks and the ships and the planes were of no use to him on those frozen hillsides of Korea. He did this job and he did it well and at a time when many were saying it could not be done. And who is this American infantryman? He's a man who but a few sh a short time ago was, was sitting in his comfortable living room, even as you. Now he's awaiting with dread the bitter endless winter night when to sleep often means not to awaken. He's the next door neighbor who accepted with such delight the extra piece of roast beef you offered him when he was over to your house last summer for supper. Now he's hacking away at a can of beef stew, which is frozen solid. Or perhaps he's the laundryman who used to deliver your bundle of spotless linen each week. Now he very often doesn't change his shirt for two months. This man, wh whom you know so well, is now a part of an unbeaten body of fighting men, the American infantryman. He's you, your soldier, in that distant land now because you've asked him to be there. There's nothing anyone can add to what Lieutenant Fallon has said. Thank you, Bob. And thanks, too, to Sergeant Jim Heidenreich, who appeared earlier in our program. Next week, we'll have the final program in our Big Picture series. We'll show you what patrol action was like in Korea. You'll see an infantry attack on Hill 1179. You'll see the return of refugees to the city of Seoul. And with us next week will be two Signal Corps combat cameramen, two of the many cameramen who filmed the big picture in Korea. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then. Thank you.